By 1000 BC, Babylon had established a lasting national state in the south. Meanwhile, the city of Asher dominated a similar rival state, Assyria, in the north. Soon, the region's rulers, like its desert sands, would undergo a remarkable shift. Babylonia will compete for power against North Mesopotamia, home to the ancient world's fiercest fighting machine, the Assyrians. The empires were getting bigger and bigger and more and more ruthless. The Assyrians, a Semitic people, had inhabited North Mesopotamia for at least 4,000 years. By the 9th century BC, their conquests extended far beyond Asher, the capital city and heartland of Assyria. From 885 to 860 BC, Assyrian king Asher Nazirpal II was intensely focused on military matters. He wants to build up the power of Assyria. It had previously, several hundred years earlier, had been a major power. And Ashurnazirpal seems to have been determined to reinstate it as a major power. And the whole emphasis of the administration is on military matters. Ashurnazirpal's campaign set a standard for the future warrior kings of Assyria, who were ruthless, determined empire builders. The reliefs that are carved into the walls of the palaces of the Assyrian kings show siege engines ripping apart the walls of enemy cities. We see warships with battering rams on them. We see chariots. We see cavalry. We see infantry digging tunnels underneath the walls of the cities that they're besieging. The empires were getting bigger and bigger and more and more ruthless. The sadistic cruelty Asher Nazirpal inflicted on war captives and his own subjects protesting taxation was legendary. He would make a point of being as brutal as possible. He describes in gruesome detail flaying people, putting their skins on the wall of the city, making pillars of decapitated heads. Really horrible, gruesome stuff. According to scholars, he probably didn't do it everywhere. He would take one city and do it as an example and terrify everyone else into obeying. By the time of Asher Nazirpal's death in 860 BC, his kingdom extended north to the borders of modern eastern Turkey and to the Mediterranean Sea. In the century following his reign, a lust to control Babylonia dominated the Assyrian monarchy. The Assyrian kings wanted to be king of the four quarters of the universe, or they wanted to be king of everything. Now, they didn't know how big the world was. Everything was them and Babylonia. And if Babylonia was outside of that, then they weren't king of the four quarters of the universe. So it, they needed, I think, perhaps to feel they controlled it. But the Babylonians, it seemed, had their own ideas about how they wanted to live. Babylonia refused to buy into Assyria as its overlord. And so was constantly breaking away. And Assyria tried a number of different things. They would put their own Babylonian king on. They would put the son of the Assyrian king on. The Assyrian king himself would be the king. Still, no matter what trouble was brewing between the two cultures, the Assyrians, ironically, always held the Babylonian civilization in high regard. Even though the Assyrians were all-powerful, they still had a sense of cultural inferiority vis-a-vis -vis Babylonia. They saw Babylonia uh, as the source of uh, the best 
tablets, uh, real cuneiform culture, much as uh, in the 19th century Americans might have looked to England as, you know, the place where you would find real English literature and drama and such. The Assyrians also felt a strong bond with the Babylonians. They spoke the same language, they worshipped the same gods, they wore the same clothes. This was a, a sister culture, but it was a much older sister culture and it was one that they had tremendous respect for. But that changed beginning in 704 BC with the reign of the Assyrian king Sennacherib. His army marched south several times to put down revolts in Babylonia. He initially set up a puppet king and that puppet king was removed. And then he put his crown prince on the throne of Babylon. This was his loved son. He, he was his eldest son. It was the man who was going to become king of Assyria after him. He was doing the Babylonians, presumably he thought, a great favor by blessing them with, with his son. In 688 BC, Sennacherib's son, Ashur Nadin Shumi, was captured and killed by an invading army. Sennacherib blamed the Babylonians for failing to protect and defend him. His relationship with the Babylonians got worse and worse. And in the end, he did what was unthinkable in a way, which was to go in and besiege Babylon. And he was brutal to it. I pressed upon the enemy like the onset of a raging storm. I decimated the enemy host with arrow and spear. All their bodies I bored through like a sieve. I cut their throats like lambs. He destroyed the city. He burned down buildings, he razed temples. He took the statues of gods and had his soldiers destroy them. Now, this is complete desecration. It's, it's, it's sacrilege. Then he cursed the city. He said, no one can rebuild Babylon for 70 years. Sennacherib's actions angered the Assyrians who believed Babylon's destruction invited the gods' wrath. Even the king's own family disliked him. He was killed by his own son. And there are two stories about how he died. One was that he was stabbed. And the other one was that the son took one of those enormous statues of a bull and toppled it on his father. So he was crushed underneath this heavy, heavy stone sculpture. What a horrible way to go. Upon Sennacherib's death, his youngest son, Esarhaddon, became king of Assyria in 680 BC. Immediately, he wanted to rebuild Babylon and correct the huge mistake he believed his father had made. Yet he knew he would not outlive the 70-year curse recorded for posterity on a clay tablet. Desperate, Esarhaddon consulted the priests and made a startling discovery. He discovered it wasn't 70 years after all, that they had been reading the tablet upside down. And in fact, it was 11 years, because the, in, the, in the way that numbers are written in cuneiform, 70, if you turn it upside down, is 11. And there it is. All they had to wait was 11 years. Esser hadn't ordered the city rebuilt. He used the spoils from his conquests to help finance the construction. When Esarhaddon died in 669 BC, he left his eldest son, Ashurbanipal, a kingdom that stretched from Egypt to Persia. Ashurbanipal was one of Mesopotamia's most cultured rulers and claimed a unique skill. He said, I, Ashurbanipal, who can read and write. And, um, he wanted to have a collection of all the literary works in his kingdom, and he wanted it to be in his palace at Nineveh. Ashurbanipal began sending agents to search out cuneiform tablets 
in the archives and schools of the Babylonian temples. His scribes then meticulously copied and cataloged some 20,000 of them before they were housed in what was the world's first library. Among the entire collection, though, Ashurbanipal especially valued more than 300 omen texts that he believed predicted the future. If the constellation Aries is faint, the king will encounter misery. If the stars of Orion sparkle, someone influential will get too much power and commit evil deeds. Most of the tablets had to do with the kinds of omen divination that was important for him if he was to rule properly in accord with the will of the gods and really survive as, as king. Ashurbanipal was not only a scholar, but also a military leader. Under his command, the Assyrian Empire controlled the entire Near East, the greatest land area ever in Assyrian rule. So for them, that was the universe, that was everything. But after Ashurbanipal's death in 627 BC, new power brokers would deliver crushing blows to the Assyrian Empire. These guys are forming a pincer's attack on the Assyrian heartland. Late in the 7th century BC, Babylon was in chaos. Ashurbanipal, the Assyrian king who also reigned over Babylon, had died. In the ancient Near East, as soon as one king died, everybody tried to break away, um, thinking that there would be a moment of weakness in the empire. And that's when you have a bit of chaos, because everybody wants a piece of the throne. In 627 BC, a local leader of uncertain origin named Nabopolassar began vying for Babylon's throne. He seems to have been a governor of Babylonia. And in the first millennium, you have a number of different ethnic groups in Babylon and Babylonia. And he is in charge of one of them. He seems to have won these skirmishes and claimed the King of Babylon title. Professing to be a man of the people, King Nabopolassar was determined to win South Mesopotamia's independence from the north. In 626 BC, he began waging war against Babylonia's Assyrian administration. Within 10 years, Nabopolassar had solidified his control over Babylonia and then began to threaten the Assyrian heartland. He starts ejecting the Assyrian garrisons and then pushing north into Assyria proper. By 615, he's operating with armies in Assyria itself. And he's joined there by people pushing in from northern Iran, principally Medes. So either operating independently or in concert, these guys are forming a pincer's attack on the Assyrian heartland. In 614 BC, the Medes sacked the city of Nimrud, and a year later brought down Asher, the spiritual and cultural center of Assyria. In 612, a coalition of Medes and Babylonians marched against Nineveh, and after a three-month siege, Nineveh fell. The once mighty Assyrian empire was finished. Assyria essentially falls victim to its own drive towards maximization, towards conquering. It's not a country whose power is necessarily based on treaties. And as soon as uh, Assyria's power wanes, it basically stands alone and it falls apart. 
Nabopolassar's hard-won victory against his city's ages-old rival was sweet. They slaughtered the land of Assyria. They turned the hostile land into heaps and ruins. But the Assyrian, who since distant days had rule over all the peoples, and with his heavy yoke had brought injury to the people of the land, his feet from Akkad I turned back, and his yoke I threw off. In 605 BC, Nabopolassar died and was succeeded as king of Babylon by his eldest son, Nebuchadnezzar II. He had served as commander of his father's army and soon proved to be the equal of all the great Mesopotamian conquerors from Sargon onward. He managed to reign for uh, more than 40 years in the course of which he established Babylonian control over much of the western territories of the former Assyrian Empire. Included in Nebuchadnezzar's empire was the kingdom of Judah. In 600 BC, the king, Jehoiakim, made a fateful decision not to pay annual tribute to Babylon. In revenge, Nebuchadnezzar marched west in December 598 BC and attacked Jerusalem, Judah's capital and the spiritual center of the Jewish people. In a battle lasting three months, the Babylonian army was victorious. Nebuchadnezzar ordered what is known in Jewish history as the exile, the deportation to Babylon of thousands of Jews, including the king and his family. One of the ways of stabilizing a conquered territory was to take a political elite and a social elite that had not proved reliable or cooperative and replace them with a new population of people who had no ties to the place. Nebuchadnezzar had acquired an empire comparable to that of Assyria. Like the Assyrian kings, he devoted much of the empire's resources to refurbishing and enlarging his capital city so that it became the largest metropolis in the ancient world. Those are really efforts that could go into the Guinness Book of Records. The excavator of Babylon estimates that Nebuchadnezzar actually used about 15 million baked bricks in his refurbishment projects of his city. Apparently, Nebuchadnezzar was a perfectionist. The ceremonial Ishtar Gate, with its depiction of mythological animals, was rebuilt three times. Lions on the gate represent the goddess Ishtar, while a demon called Amushushu signifies Marduk, Babylon's principal god and head of the Mesopotamian pantheon. From a Hammurabi's Taiwan, Marduk is one of the great gods of the Near East. He's not the god of anything in particular, but he managed to conquer the, the evil goddess whose name was Tiamat. She was the goddess of the sea. And he takes her body and he splits it in two. And with the upper part, he creates the heavens, and with the lower part, he creates the earth. The Ishtar Gate stood at the end of the processional way that led to Babylon's temples and ziggurat the 650-foot-tall temple tower known as the Tower of Babel. Ziggurats throughout Mesopotamian history, they're a sign of religious architecture. They're massive structures. They take a lot of man hours to build. Only a king with power and wealth can initiate such a project and finish it. And the reasoning behind building the Tower of Babel seems to be personal glory as well. Within Nebuchadnezzar's magnificent palace were hanging gardens. They were reported by the Greek historian Herodotus to have been one of the world's great wonders. The gardens were supposedly constructed for the king's wife, a homesick Iranian princess who was comforted by the terraced buildings and exotic plants. However, the hanging gardens of Babylon may be nothing more than a myth. 
Unfortunately, in Mesopotamian sources, we have really no indication of any such thing. On the other hand, it is true that one of the things that a good Mesopotamian king did was cultivate royal gardens in which you could display plants and animals from the empire. This was one of the ways of showing the scale and range of conquest and therefore giving a kind of living, breathing, green image of um, power. Nebuchadnezzar died at the age of 84 in 562 BC. During his reign, Babylon's arts, sciences, and literature flourished under considerable wealth and strong state support. But all was not perfect beneath the shining surface. Next, Babylon comes under the control of a king loyal to the enemy. In June 556 BC, a commoner named Nabonidus became king of Babylon in the aftermath of a bloody coup. He was immediately unpopular with Babylon's priests and people. Not only did he claim to have been a loyal subject of the city's old nemesis, Assyria, but he also ignored Babylon's principal god, Marduk, in favor of the god of his mother. Nebuchadnezzar is very much close to his mother, who seems to be a priestess dedicated to the god Sin, the moon god. In 549 BC, Nabonidus did the unthinkable. He left his son Belshazzar in charge and for a decade abandoned Babylon to build and restore temples devoted to the moon god in Tema in southern Arabia and Haran in north Mesopotamia. The people in Babylon are quite unhappy with Nabonidus because they feel like he has forsaken them. Belshazzar failed to take seriously a looming threat, Persian imperialism. The Achaemenid dynasty in southwestern Iran was becoming the dominant force in the Near East. They owed their success to rigorous military training. Persian boys had to learn how to ride horses well, as well as the art of archery. And so in these two military tactics, the Persians were quite good. In 559 BC, a new king ascended the Achaemenid throne, who had a quality not usually found in a conqueror. Tolerance. His name was Cyrus the Great. In 10 years, he became famous not only for his military prowess, but also for a bloodless victory against the Iranian Medes. He is going to take on this amazing campaign of first conquering the Iranian plateau, which was ruled by the Medes. Before the battle, a large number of the Median contingent, their forces actually come to Cyrus and desert the Median ruler. And hence, uh, he's victor before even the battle begins. By 546 BC, Cyrus had amassed a vast empire, stretching from Asia Minor in the west to the Iranian plateau in the east. All that was left was Babylon. Mesopotamia's political, cultural, and religious center, and Babylonian territories in Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine. Conquering them would mean the birth of a new world empire, a feat Cyrus couldn't resist. Babylon is the center of the world, the capital of the world at this time. Once Cyrus steps into Babylonia, and the city of Babylon, and he pretty much has changed world history. You are now the master of the capital of the world. Now he's going to descend upon Babylonia. 
In 539 BC, Nabonidus returned to save his kingdom, but he was too late. The Persians killed Belshazzar, captured Nabonidus, and then took Babylon without any resistance. The Babylonians were tired of their absent king and welcomed Cyrus not as a conqueror, but as a liberator. In fact, green twigs are placed before his feet. A state of peace is imposed into the city. One of the first things that he does is to go to the temple of Marduk to perform the rites and rituals which Nabonidus had forsaken. Nabonidus was exiled to central Iran, where he was given a government post as part of a Persian policy of amnesty. Cyrus took the title King of Babylon and King of the Lands. By pursuing a policy of generosity instead of repression, and by favoring the local religion, he was able to make enthusiastic supporters of his new subjects. Cyrus also reached out to Babylon's Jewish population, and in 537 BC, he let 40,000 exiles return to Palestine. The Jews considered him a savior who delivered them from 60 years of captivity. Under the rule of the Achaemenid Persian kings, southern Mesopotamia flourished for some 200 years. Babylon remained the economic center of the empire and was the winter residence of the Persian court. 